Okay. I see the participants coming in, I guess. Anthony, I can see you on my screen, so um, if you could give me a, you know, okay, can go. So good afternoon to all. Um, welcome to the Global Health Colloquium. My name is Arbel Greener, and I am a postdoctoral, postdoctoral research associate with Princeton University's Global Health Program. And before I introduce to you today's very special speaker, I would like to thank, uh, to thank those who helped making this webinar possible, especially the incredible incredibly supportive, helpful um, Sarah Goldman and Justine Connelline at our Center for Health and Wellbeing, uh, the Peronsta Global Health Program, our Administrative Director Gilbert Collins, our Academic Directors Professor Zendra Graham and Jessica Metcalf, and Suzanne Chandler that assists Dr. Jaya Mukherjee and whose prompt, kind, and efficient help has been invaluable to allow for today's event to happen. Um, so on a quick research on the internet using the words Jaya and Mukherjee, we will find websites, pictures, articles, and videos portraying a woman that seems omnipresent. Different films show this woman explaining her health philosophy committed to social justice and to siding with the most vulnerable. She will be seen explaining how COVID-19 should be approached and contained and how measures of care require solidarity and imply the involvement of society as a whole. She will be seen defending universal health coverage at, in a United States, sorry, United Nations session in September of 2019 and asking for more funds to invest in the delivery of comprehensive health care worldwide. Another video will show her immediately after leaving that same meeting in the UN headquarters and leading a street protest, protest in New York advocating for the implementation of health as a human right. Joya Mukherjee is a physician, a professor, and an activist. She's an internist, a pediatrician, an infectious disease doctor, and public health specialist that has been the chief medical officer of Partners in Health, PIH, a powerful international medical charity dedicated to providing a preferential option for the poor in healthcare. Those of us who study, teach, and practice global health have learned that partners in health are a fundamental and ubiquitous actor of this field or of this set of problems, as the organization's co-founder and chief strategist, Paul Farmer, puts it. We have read their books, studied their concepts, accompanied the innovative work they do with the poor, with governments, and with mobilizing those in power to help improve the delivery of health and care. For Partners in Health, persistent diseases are lossy where forces of oppression, extraction, and disregard have historically operated, creating a pathogenic environment that acts on more susceptible and vulnerable bodies, reiterating extreme suffering and inequality. For Partners in Health, illness is a process, a journey, and therefore demands the best treatment, but also that the patient is supported by their community. The organization defends an um, accompaniment approach which prioritizes, prioritizes solid support over compliance. They understand health systems have a responsibility to meet patients where they are with new materials, methods, and means as necessary until outcomes are equitable. Incorporating community health workers into health interventions, PIH says, put spirit of justice above expediency and equity and human decency above cost as a primary measurement guiding global health. Dr. Mukherjee is also an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. She teaches global health delivery, social medicine, infectious disease, and human rights to medical students, residents, and fellows at a wide variety of US and international institutions. She has helped create a new residency in fellow and fellowship training program for Rwandan and Haitian physicians, as well as global health residencies and fellowships for US trainees at Harvard and other American universities. At the same time, she strives to remain close to people in the poorest corners of the world, listening to their stories and understanding the historical and economic forces that account for their persist persistent suffering. 
Dr. Mukherjee has been supporting PIH's efforts to provide high quality comprehensive health care to the poorest in partnership with local communities and health officials in Haiti, Rwanda, Lesotho, Malawi, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Peru, Mexico, Russia, Kazakhstan, and the Navajo Nation. She's the recipient of many awards and honorary titles, and her numerous articles have been published in journals such as the British Medical Journal and the Lancet Global Health. In 2016, she published An Introduction to Global Health Delivery, Practice, Equity, Human Rights with Ox Oxford University Press. In talking about her book, Dr. Mukherjee advises the young, the students, and I quote her, don't keep adding degrees because you don't know what you want to do. Get out there and do it. And if your parents question it, they can talk to me. So without further ado, please join me in virtually, but warmly welcome, uh, welcoming Dr. Do Joy Mukherjee. Thank you so much, Arbel. Um, I forgot I said that, but I agree with myself. Um, can you all see my slides? I'm only seeing the speakers, so can we make sure the slides are up? You can see them? Okay, then. Then I minimize myself. Um, so I'm going to talk to you about COVID-19, health equity, and the next pandemic. Um, and just what I've observed now uh, as Chief Medical Officer of Partners in Health, spending my entire career um, on global health, mostly outside of the United States, and then being at the epicenter of the pandemic here in the United States and what we can learn from the scholarly um, investigation of health inequity. Uh, next slide. Trying to slides are not advancing. There we go. So Partners in Health, just briefly, we work in 11 countries around the world, including the United States, Navajo Nation, now in Massachusetts, as well as many other municipalities on COVID, uh, five African countries, um, as well as uh, Peru, Mexico, and Haiti, and Latin America and the Caribbean, and Russia and Kazakhstan. So we have a broad swath of areas, um, regions, and countries countries, localities that we work in. And we do everything from support of governments to providing basic food uh, uh, and shelter for people. So I'm going to talk about pandemic preparedness. Uh, pan the concept of pandemic preparedness from a public health standpoint is rooted in these concepts, prevention, detection, rapid response health systems. Uh, but what's not really been evaluated or unpacked is the nature of these conditions. Like what is a state of preparedness? What does that mean? What constitutes preparedness? And what ought to be funded and not funded? And so those are the things that I'll be talking about. I think we have a rubric um, in the US uh, academic study of public health on what preparedness ought to be. But I think what the COVID-19 pandemic shows us is that, that the, the states of preparedness and what constitutes preparedness needs to be re-examined. And we need to readdress the validity of these constructs, even as academic constructs. So in late 2019, this uh, Global Health Security Index uh, was published. Uh, it was developed by the Nuclear Threat Institute, uh, as well as Johns Hopkins University and the Economist Intelligence Unit, not Unity. Um, they, they, in this Global Health Security Index, they evaluated these different elements of pandemic preparedness, right? So rapid response, detection, reporting, health systems. And they came up with a ranking of what countries in the world were most prepared for pandemics because the way global health security is looked at from again, language we must unpack. What is security? Is it security for the poorest of the poor or is it security for us sitting in our comfortable houses in the United States even as others suffer? 
So this global health security index was to stop pandemics from traveling around the world. These are the elements. This is the ranking. So within this global health security index score, the very top of the heap is the United States. And remember, this is published in late 2019. At the bottom, in the bottom left-hand corner, you see um, a blue, yellow, and green flag. That's the flag of Rwanda. And I'm going to give some examples from Rwanda, a place that Partners in Health has worked now since 2015, uh, 2005, excuse me, and Belgium for historical context, which is um, up in the sort of middle uh, right hand side. So again, at the top of the heap in terms of global health security index, ranked first in the world in a number of indicators, including epidemiologic workforce, biosecurity, emergency preparedness, and response planning. Okay. However, we're going to look at Belgium, the United States, and Rwanda, and try to address what is happening today just a few months after this index was published um, in the real experiment of nature that is COVID. So I'm, uh, I'm comparing, trying to compare apples to apples here. We have the state of Georgia in the United States, which has a population of about 10 million. We have the nation of Rwanda, which is a similar population. I'm trying to move that, but I can't. A uh, similar population, 11,000, and the nation of Rwanda, which has a population of 12, excuse me, 11 million and 12 million. In the first 30 days, which one could argue is whether or not you're prepared, right? A case of COVID comes in, are you prepared to contain that? Because that first 30 days is the critical point where all of those elements would come into play. In the first 30 days in Georgia, the epidemic went from two cases to 4,400 cases. In the first 30 days in Belgium, from two or three cases to 7,400 cases. And in Rwanda, it went from one case to 34 cases. Now, if you look at the number of doctors per 1,000, the, the state of Georgia, home of the once venerated CDC, has two doctors per thousand, Belgium similar, three per thousand, and in Rwanda only 0.1. So as we look at that, we see very big differences. And I'll remind you that in preparedness, Rwanda was near the bottom, certainly in the bottom uh, quartile of expected preparedness and response. So how did the measurers get this so wrong? so quickly. And that's what I'm going to talk about. And here, by the way, are confirmed cases now, uh, not just the first month, but as I said, the first month is emblematic of how one responds. Georgia now is off the map at 283,000 cases. Uh, Belgium is up in the 80,000 range, and Rwanda still has not even uh, reached 1,000. So these are very different trajectories very different trajectories. And of course, trajectories that are associated with significant suffering. So the first thing I would say is this is not a house. This is not a house just as this is not a health system. The United States, what I have recognized now working uh, for the last eight months on COVID in the United States is that the US does not have a health system. And so again, if we go back quickly, sorry, if we go back to these elements, right? Health system is central. The United States doesn't have a health system. It has a collection of elements of a health system. Just like this house is not a house. It is a collection of plywood nails. Uh, and what we have is we have private households, private employers, some state funded programs, some federal funded programs, some privately funded programs, providers of healthcare who then apply to these different things. There's out of pocket expenditure and other private spending. And so fundamentally we see that 
when we are judged as having a health system, and again, going back to interrogating language and validity of concepts, the concept that the United States has a health system is invalid. Um, a health system in many countries looks like you get sick, someone in your community may be the first person you talk to, or you go to a primary health care center. If you're too sick for that health care center, they refer you to a hospital. And your uh, right to health is respected by your government, and so your out-of-pocket payment is minimal. That is a system of care that is publicly funded. We do not have that. We have a system of medical illness that is cared for by largely private providers and insurance companies, but it is not a system. So in medicine, we commonly talk about the social determinants of health. Um, and that's the second thing I wanna talk about, which is the social determinants of health are those things, food, health, uh, uh, housing, employment, that will allow you to live a healthy life. And there have many, been many scholars, probably the most famous one being Sir Michael Marmot, who talked about the importance of these social determinants in, in health of the population. And I was once an engineer many years ago, and so I like to think of these not as determinants, but in fact forces. This is an engineering diagram, classic engineering diagram of forces, right? And if we put on here COVID, what we see is that COVID can be controlled or it can degenerate into chaos. And it depends on the forces that are in the balance here. What we see is that these forces, and I, I apologize, I wanna, can you see this? Oh, there we go. The, these forces are biologic, but not only biologic. They are also social. They are also political. And that things that can help with control include and counterbalance, right? The biology of COVID is basically the same everywhere but the social approaches, the political approaches are very different. Um, and we can balance the, the biology and the social forces through care, equity, trust, and leadership. And none of these things are actually measured in that global health security construct that I showed you. Missing from this is care. What is the moral basis upon which we care for one another? Do we use compassion, solidarity, mutuality? What is the equity agenda? Are we paying attention to the most vulnerable or are we in fact discounting the elderly who die, the, the people from poor communities who die? What trust do people have in the system, which is very much related to the quality of services? and the accessibility. If people understand they will have to pay $300 for a COVID test, I guarantee you they're not gonna get that test. And then lastly, what this doesn't measure and we've seen to be ex exceedingly important in every epidemic I've worked in, Ebola, cholera, HIV, TB, is leadership. And that is leadership with compassion, with logic, with reason, and with accountability. And so, what I think we've seen is putting forward a series of technical elements of global health security without these countervailing forces that are needed to control pandemics. So let me talk a little bit about our response, Partners in Health's response to COVID. Um, we, we really focus on these three areas. One is leadership, and I just last night drove back to, from Newark, New Jersey, where we're working uh, with the city of Newark, having a retreat right now uh, with that team. Our job is to accompany leaders uh, through global advocacy support and support of government leadership. Often, the public sector has been weakened historically. And because of the privatized elements, the Department of Public Health, whether it's in Sierra Leone or Newark, New Jersey, has been gutted. 
And so helping the Department of Public Health to find money, to get and use money is a critical part of our work. The second is really care. So we have understood through a variety of epidemics that people will not come forward for testing unless they know they'll be treated well. So that's about making sure people get what they need. So for example, in the state of Massachusetts, we have created a cadre we call the resource care coordinators. If someone cannot quarantine because they don't have food, we make sure they get food. And if you think that 12% of people in Massachusetts that need quarantine, need to quarantine for COVID, need material support, and is 12% in the richest state in the richest country in the world, what is that in other places? So without that care and that wraparound type of support and community engagement, we can't really expect people to come forward because a lot of people's ability to protect themselves is around their economic and material agency to do so. Um, trust is based on people getting the care they need when they need it. And again, because of the extremely fragmented nature of our system in the United States, there is a huge lack of trust in the system. And then equity, holding ourselves accountable to the most vulnerable. And this is never more true than in pandemics because with infectious diseases, uh, you cannot eradicate something unless you are reaching out to the most vulnerable. Otherwise, these diseases will continue to spread. So I'll talk a little bit about care, the moral basis, the compassion, the solidarity, the mutuality. Um, for us, this is a picture from Haiti. That often means community health workers. This is Iruz Charles, who's a community health worker in Haiti. She provides longitudinal treatment to this patient with HIV, brings medicines to her, she, but she is still working with a clinic. She is not independent of a system. She is part of a system, an integral part. And Many of our CHWs and even our community people who are participating are from the communities themselves. They may have even suffered the same diseases and certainly the same conditions. And that psychosocial support is part of that, including mental health services. What about equity and the next pandemic? These community health workers and community-based organizations we learned a lot of this work from HIV and TB. So a lot of the work in reaching every person with TB and HIV, we worked through community participation. And then we could provide, we, we realized that we learned these lessons and that prepared us for the next pandemic because we had engaged communities from TB that could then be used and worked with to uh, treat HIV. A second lesson that we learned about care is that solidarity is very different than security. This is a picture of my colleagues from Zami La Sante, also in Haiti, performing a clinic um, in an internally displaced people's camp in, um, in, in Port-au-Prince after the Haitian earthquake. And we were there, we were providing care for hundreds uh, of and even thousands of people a day. And the US military came with food and everyone needed food. And they said, we wanna come on a day where Zami Lasente is there in the, in the displaced person's camp. And we said, well, why? You, know, you should come on a different day, it's super busy. And they said, oh no, you um, will provide us the security. The US military said our doctors, skinny as they are, as you see, and community health workers would provide security to the US Army. Why? Because the people trusted that this group was just there in solidarity and didn't want anything, was there in service, was, spoke the language. And so when we think of global health security, I would argue that in the provision of care and showing up, you're actually providing global health solidarity, which is a quite different thing. 
And then what about equity? What does it take to have equity as an agenda? Well, we understand because we've worked in this space what it means to reach the most vulnerable. So as I mentioned, food, mental health services, shelter, providing transport. And so because we had designed systems to do, this is a picture from our COVID work in Peru, but this was based on the architecture of a TB program. Again, the preparation for the next epidemic was that we understood that this equity agenda was needed to fight COVID. Um, this is just an example of how providing accessible quality services allows you to engender trust. So in our work in Haiti on HIV, we realized that we couldn't get people to come to the clinic unless they believed that care was available in general. People didn't come for one disease just like people aren't gonna just come for COVID testing. And so the wraparound services of having drugs, having a person who will see you, having, um, you know, not having to pay an exorbitant fee, that uh, was our strategy for building up primary healthcare in several clinics. This is an example from four clinics in rural Haiti, putting in staff in essential drugs decreasing the user fees and having an army of community health workers resulted in the clinics being heavily utilized. And then we could deal with the HIV epidemic, but we didn't go in with just looking at the, the, the pandemic we were facing. So systems and scale that are based in the community with, with community trust that that have health centers that function with people that can refer sick people to hospitals. This is really what a health system looks like, not just the plywood for a house. And this is what we've learned from fighting other pandemics that will allow people to be prepared for the next pandemic. Let me just show a picture of Rwanda this is uh, starting in 2004, right before Partners in Health was there. You see there are only a handful of places in the country where one could receive HIV treatment. But by 2013, it was every place in the country, every place in the country. And so that gives people trust in the system. So even the decentralization and expansion of services. And Rwanda has among the highest coverage of antiretroviral services. And that seems obvious, but it's not been obvious in terms of pandemic preparedness. So people don't, people look at this as a success of HIV, but this is also a success for pandemic preparedness because when you have a population that is using services, that trusts services, that doesn't have huge amounts of inequity, then when the next plague comes along, you can roll out testing, you can roll out preventive services and people trust you. This is uh, an example of how we used this infrastructure in Haiti, back to Haiti again, for the next pandemic of cholera. We diagnosed the first case of cholera in Haiti ever at a Partners in Health supported hospital because we had made those investments from the HIV epidemic that were not disease specific, but rather system specific, included community health workers, included health centers, included hospitals, that when people came in, and we're filling up the, the lobby of our hospital with this very unusual disease, we knew immediately that there was something different happening. But without that system of care, you wouldn't know that. And we had already procured IV fluids just for the general running of the hospital. So that was available without interruption for these severe cases of cholera. We had doctors and nurses that had local that had been trained in disease management. And we could, within 24 hours, mobilize an army of community health workers that could go and talk about cholera. And then what did we learn from that for the next pandemic Ebola? Well, we understood that that solidarity and care had to be central 
and move away from the law and order, that people were not going to come forward to get testing unless they were confident that care would be available. So our investments in Ebola, so in 2014, because Liberia and Sierra Leone understood the work we had done in HIV expansion in Rwanda and elsewhere in tuberculosis treatment, they said, can you come here and help us fight Ebola? Because we don't only want to fight Ebola. We want to fight this terrible health system that gives nobody care or confidence. And so we said, okay, we'll fight Ebola, but we're also going to improve the pr provision of primary health care, hospital care, and community work. And so all of these investments were what we call health system strengthening investments that included oxygen supply, blood, improved delivery. These are midwives in you know, a, a better, much better maternity room. Um, and since going there, we have seen measles, Lhasa, COVID, all of these next epidemics rely on this system of care based in solidarity and equity. Um, this is a, a after the earthquake in Haiti, we built a teaching hospital because we said providing access to high quality of care is also where we want to train the next generation of Haitian doctors and nurses. And so th this hospital, which is a teaching hospital in rural Haiti, has ventilators, blood supply, et cetera. And of course, in the COVID era, became the national referral center for COVID. So we didn't build it for pandemic preparedness. We built it because it was the right thing to do to have a system that could provide care, equity, and solidarity. And of course, with laboratory testing, oxygen, ICU beds, we now have a high quality COVID care being delivered there. So I think the last thing I'm going to mention on this list of things that were left out of the Global Health Security Index is leadership. Um, this is Jacinda Arden from New Zealand, who said the worst case scenario is simply intolerable. The government, she's talking about the government of New Zealand, will do all it can to protect you. And none of us can do this alone. So she's talking about government accountability. She's talking about the innate value of each and every human life and the idea of solidarity and mutuality in that. And in contrast, enough said. So clear communication and transparency. Everywhere I've ever worked in the many epidemics I've worked in, we see that there is always skepticism of a new disease. Uh, whether it's in Liberia, people saying Ebola is not real, or in the United States, people saying COVID is a hoax. That is always there. Of course, existential crises are met by the human condition um, as fear and skepticism. So the way to overcome this is clear communication and transparency. In Rwanda, there were immediately 200 people from both the public sector and civil society working together in the same place. It was in a well-managed, well-ventilated tent. They were all face-to-face. -face. And their electronic data systems were updated hourly and shared with the country. That model showed this extraordinary leadership with the president and the prime minister being part of the initial messages addressing populations, a system, a national system of coordination and support, and then down to district and provincial planning. So not that what we've seen here, the competition between the federal government and states. They also did contact tracing based on having a robust system of community health workers, and then the government supported quarantine and isolation. And this is what they did in just the you know, first month. Um, our work at Partners in Health, as I said, is to support that kind of leadership. 
um, through just being present for leaders, helping them to do the things they want to do. This is us building some COVID uh, testing areas around the airport in Liberia because the government didn't have the money to do that, but we did that for the public sector. We procured supplies, we upgraded facilities for the public sector to put them in the, the driver's seat. So based on all this work that we were doing in February and March around the world, uh, one of our board members, Dr. Jim Kim, uh, said, why aren't we doing this in the United States? And we said, well, we don't know. Um, and we ended up talking to Governor Charlie Baker, um, who then asked us to stand up contact tracing in support, again, in support, not separate, in support of the Department of Public Health in Massachusetts. And based on that work, then we had many requests from all over the country um, to support the, the work of contact tracing in places like Newark, Immokalee, Florida, the Navajo Nation, where we had already worked, um, and states like um, Illinois, Ohio, and North Carolina. So with that, work in the United States, we said, okay, the hospital care is probably the part in the US that's the best, but the community piece, the equity piece, the care is not there, nor is really the primary provision of care, and in this case, particularly testing. So we promoted this model of testing. Of course, everyone kept talking about testing, but they weren't talking about what to do with that tracing the people who were in contact with each person who had a positive test and isolating or quarantining the person with support. So we would say, okay, you have been in touch with a person with COVID. These are the things you need to do to keep yourself and your family safe. And then the important question, can you do it? Because if you can't, we will help you. And over time, we were able to put together a team of case investigators, contact tracers, and care resource coordinators at scale to support the Department of Public Health in the state of Massachusetts, and were able to bring under control the work. Importantly, I want to highlight the care resource coordinators who speak 23 different languages. They're often or in our case, very experienced professionals who are social workers, nurses, psychologists. They were assigned geographically to link people with available social services. And we've had in the state of Massachusetts, and this is as of the end of August, 7,000 requests for social assistance. Now, again, that's, that's amazing, right? Five percent unable to quarantine or isolate without support, 9 percent referred to the coordinator, and 12 percent lacking a health care provider. As you see, the number one thing people were lacking is food, food insecurity. So imagine what this looks like in Liberia or Haiti or Malawi. So then based on that work, we set up the public health accompaniment unit and we support uh, public health departments. We capture knowledge by uh, creating a learning collaborative across the US and then have been involved in advocacy for these kind of models within Congress um, involving the CARES Act um, and the COVID relief bills. Um, so, you know, states, cities, communities. This is a picture of our uh, team working together with community health workers that we trained in Immokalee, Florida. Immokalee, the Coalition of Immokalee Workers is an organized group of farm workers in Florida that has fought for fair pricing of the crops that they pick, but they are considered non-persons by the state. And so how we can uh, accompany the state, but at the same time, uh, most importantly, accompany these very vulnerable populations is what we're working on there. So again, back to these forces, our model is to turn this chaos that we see in the United States into control through care, equity, trust, and leadership. I just got back from the city of Newark, as I mentioned, uh, during the height of the pandemic, uh, Newark was suffering from about 300 
cases a day. Um, they're down to nine. They had one death yesterday only. They hadn't had a death in about uh, four weeks. And they have really centered their work in this extraordinary leadership of the mayor, Mayor Ross Baraka and Dr. Mark Wade, the director of public health, a trust and transparency narrative where they are constantly messaging and talking to people. Equity, they've invested especially in the unhoused population and getting people off the streets and then assuring that care is available through expanded testing, through involving the federally qualified health centers. And so to see this happen in Massachusetts and in Immokalee and in Newark, we're confident that reshaping how we think of security toward uh, solidarity is a, a very, very important work. So just to conclude and give us time for questions, uh, you know, we really have to rethink the concepts in pandemic preparedness. Inputs into a health system without a basis in care and without leadership really result in chaos, which is what we've experienced in the United States. And a focus on healthcare as a human right, equity, and addressing vulnerability is the long-term and difficult work needed to prepare for the next pandemic. So I'll stop there and definitely we have some time for questions and discussion. Okay, thank you, Dr. Marker G. Um, we, we do have a question that was put in the chat in the beginning. Can, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I'm just trying okay. to turn off my screen. There we go. Oh, okay. yes. Um, that regarded the numbers from Rwanda. Um, they were questioning, you know, the, the reliability on those numbers. If, if here yeah, in the United so States, it's, yeah. Yes, thank you for, Stacey, for that, Stacy. Actually, the numbers are very good. They do not have reporting accuracy. They uh, have invested an enormous amount in expanding their PCR capabilities. And so we know that the percent prevalence among those tested is about 2%, where in the U.S. it's about 5 And that gives us a sense that they're not missing a lot of cases. So, um, they 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 actually are doing a lot of testing. The testing is very much centralized, and um, they have much more accurate counts. I have a question um, regarding your point on cooperation and surveillance. You know, on the shift of um, of concepts that we use, and I wonder how in societies that are so fundamentally based on on a liberal idea of liberty, let's say, and I don't know if this sounds redundant, um, redundant and makes sense, but you know, how to, to engage people that believe that we are harming their, their liberties, you know, when we, we ask for cooperation in tracing contacts, for instance, or, you know, adopting measures that are necessary for mm -hmm. containing COVID-19, for instance. Well, that's why I talk about the preparedness. I think you have to build a system that's based on care. You know, if people feel cared for, um, I think, and that, that you're not in it for yourself, but you're in fact in it to help them, they don't perceive health or public health as a restriction of their liberties. But if you only race in during a pandemic, um, but you don't care about their day-to-day -day when they have diabetes or, um, you know, when they're unemployed, then I think there is a lot of resentment. And so I think a lot of the building trust has to happen before the pandemic. I mean, we're not in that situation now and we're going to have to get our way out. But, and I think it's really about leadership. Um, so, I, you, you know, I think that it is really um we have set up a society, especially in the United States, where you know, the government really does quite little for people compared to the needs and compared to the wealth we have. And 
so understandably, people don't trust then in the setting of this, you know, the restriction of liberty. Thank you. Um, we have another question from I Caroline. See yeah, I can, okay. yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, mine going from engineering to global health was just uh, going to medical school, but there are other ways too. There are lots of engineers now that are involved in, um, there's such a big need for engineering, for civil engineering, particularly um, that, you know, just looking to get some experience as an engineer working abroad, I think is what I would do. Look at organizations you admire, um, the whole field of wash water and sanitation uh, is really in need of engineers. Um, there's a lot of need for agricultural engineering. And so um, there's, there's architectural uh, work in engineering now in global health. So I think just looking at organizations you admire and seeing where your skill sets would fit in, I think is how to do it, unless you wanna do what I do and just and do what I did and just go to medical school. There is another question um, from Stacy. Yeah. Last time we had a similar yeah. pandemic, you said, right? So she's... Yeah. Um, so, you know, I don't think we haven't adapted our responses because I think these are human things. I just think any pandemic, you will have resistance, right? So the question is, you should prepare for the fact that the way to get around that is to care for people, to protect people, um, and that will decrease the resistance. And we saw this so much in Ebola, right? The, in the beginning, the, the Ebola centers, I, I won't call them Ebola treatment centers, they were holding centers. So you just go there to die and separate yourself out from others. People don't wanna do that. But if they understand, um, yeah, I, I, I th I'm, I'm trying to say the questions again. I, I see, Lauren, your comment. Um, so um, at the so at the end of the um, the day, I think the the way we communicate um, about it shouldn't be um, assuming that if people have skepticism, they're wrong, right? So that was the question. Last time we had a similar pandemic, people responded with similar resistance. Why have we not adapted our responses based on that? I think it, that's human nature and our responses should be good communication, leadership, solidarity. Yeah, so sorry about that. We didn't know, um, the questions didn't show to you. There is a question now in the Q&A session that I believe everyone can see. And is there any new point which we should improve about security index score after COVID-19? Yeah, I mean, I, uh, that, that's what I was trying to outline. So yes, I, I would include equity. Um, so I think systems that generate a lot of health inequity are not prepared for COVID. And that's what we've seen in the United States with the racial divide being as huge as it is and the class divide. Um, so I think that's one. I think there should be elements of leadership and clarity of communication. Uh, again, we would have fallen way off in that because of the very confusing, disingenuous, non-scientific communication. Um, and the trust that people have in the system. So those four, that was the, really the point uh, now of the, the lecture, which is these four elements, whether people have care, whether they have equity, whether they trust the system, and whether we have leadership. Those are missing from the current health security index. I was expecting this Q&A session to be full of questions. <laughs> no, there's plenty. Sebastian asked, the idea of scarcity of resources is so prevalent when discussing possibilities for health access for the world's poor. How do we approach the goal of health equity when scarcity is such a pressing concern? Um, I have been extremely fortunate um, in my career, in my life, and in, in what I've seen to believe that the way to address that scarcity is through strong social movements. 
um, because the movement for HIV treatment access, which I highlight in my writing as the real beginning of the global health movement, was people just saying the scarcity is not acceptable, like that we, we can't, we just won't do it. And that created new funding uh, for AIDS in the form of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, which is now over $60 billion that has been dispersed to governments. So I think the scarcity, understanding the history and political economy of scarcity, I mean, each and every one of us, right, are materially dependent on the Congo, right? Cell phones would not exist if it weren't for coltan. And yet we think the Congo is quote unquote aid dependent. Well, we're a, we are Congo dependent. And so until we think of a really restructuring of global cash flows, and that needs to be done through global movement. So I think addressing the scarcity is means not accepting the, the racist and extractionist sort of colonial world and looking at new ways to have global collaboration. I also wanted to ask, and um, I think you've uh, addressed some of this already, but we drive our actions um, many times by following goals that are set by international organisms. So um, I'm thinking, of course, of the sustainable development goals and um, how helpful they really are in guiding healthcare um, delivery worldwide when we know, you know that most of the times, right, we do not meet them by their deadline or um, yes, that they, they might be so such hard references to follow, right? Yeah, I think, I think it depends on who's setting the goals and what goals are being set. So for example, the idea of the sustain or the, let's take the Millennium Development Goals. The, those were actually called for by the movement for AIDS treatment access, for example, by people living with HIV, saying we must have access to treatment. So whereas, you know, some of the child survival, and I see there's a question, someone works for UNICEF, so I'll address that, but we're driven by, well, you have $5, this is the best you can do. So I think the analysis of who is setting the goal and what the goal is about and whose voice is being heard, I think those are very important. So we focused a lot before the AIDS treatment access movement, a lot of the focus on child survival was because it was cheap, you know, and yes, children deserve special protection, but you know, without parents, like kids don't do very well. So, you know, who made the decision to leave the parents out of the equation and focus just on child health, right? So I think um, trying to always honor the voice of the people who are most affected is very important. Um, so, I do have, you want to read? I work for UNICEF and we've seen in so many countries the devastating indirect effects of pandemic on maternal and child health services. Services have in some cases stopped or at least been disrupted by lockdowns, travel restrictions. I would think the security index should also include an assessment of ways in which a country commits to ensuring those essential services. I agree. Yeah, that's also not there. It, assuring essential services is a critical part of how we should evaluate countries. Okay. I had another question, if I, if I may. Go ahead, Sebastian. Uh, so uh, we've seen such a long conversation within global health about trying to kind of pin down exactly what works and in what ways things actually do end up working. And so we've seen this proliferation of uh, strategies and techniques uh, that are kind of trying to pin down exactly what is the uh, variable that actually uh, creates change in a particular place. And it seems to me that oftentimes that gets in the way of actually doing stuff. Um, so I was wondering, how do you see 
kind of that conversation is like is there really that big of a lack of understanding like what we can do or is there like or do we really need to kind of broaden our conversation about like how to intervene and find out what's working at the same time yeah i i i'm with you sebastian i think we spend too much time you know the idea that we're going to do a needs assessment that we're going to do you know an evaluation and all this like of course we don't want to do unevaluated things but you know when i started working in hiv globally um and we started treating hiv in haiti at partners in health people said well you know it hasn't been studied as if somehow the this amazing transformative drug cocktail wouldn't work in black people so, you know, I think we can't let the notion of studying things really get in the way of things that are based on logic and human dignity. Um, and so, and, and certain basic rights. I mean, if we look at healthcare as an inalienable right, then we don't have to have a proof of concept. Like, is it good to save a kid? Like, I, you know, I don't really need anyone to study that. Um, or is it better to give a vaccine or set a fracture? Like that to me is an argument that leads to nihilism. And so a lot of the studies that I think you're referencing, Sebastian, are about, do you do this or this? They're about priority setting. And if we're gonna set priorities based on diseases, then we're really not taking healthcare as a human right. So if we start off to say, this is the expansive notion of what people need and fight for that, that's a very different thing than trying to evaluate if this or this works. I don't know if that's what you're getting at, but um, that's the way I look at it. Yeah, that's exactly what I was getting at, thanks. Okay, we have a question. Given the structural power of America's public health residing in the state, do you think a unified response is possible? How do we, you know, I, I, I think a unified response would be possible in the United States. I think it is very late in the game. And I think if we had a federal government that believed in unity, that believed in, um, you know, the universal dignity of life, we could have done it. Whether we can do it now, I don't know. And this is not only Trump, right? This is a legacy of slavery. Remember that the whole state's rights argument in the United States comes from the Civil War, comes from the succession of the South. And so the people like Mitch McConnell who support states' rights, have the states decide, are supporting an agenda that allows people to discriminate. And, and so we're, we're not just talking about an ide ideology of, you know, federalism versus states' rights. We're talking about an ideology that's deeply rooted in racism. And so um, I think what it would take to have a federal response is leadership that is strongly anti-racist and that is about care. Um, Jennifer asks, you talked about the situation in Belgium, which was quite bad at the beginning of the pandemic, although Belgium has socialist health care system. I'm not sure what's going wrong in Belgium, so I've got to look into that more. Uh, it's a good question. So um, I think that that would be an interesting uh, question. That's a place I don't know. I just kind of used it for comparison because that was the former colonial master of Rwanda, though I was trying to be cheeky but I don't know exactly what went wrong in Belgium. So I do want to, okay, to encourage, you know, everyone that is here to, to uh, participate in the conversation. If, if you want this, you know, we've been expecting um, this, this talk for months now. Dr. Joyo was supposed to talk to us to come to the colloquia in uh, March when, when everything was shut down. Yeah. So just before letting her go, <laughs> I'll encourage you once more to. We have a few more questions up. in the chat. I think. Yeah, mm -hmm. I see now. Mm -hmm. Okay, do you want to go ahead, Heidi? And 
Sure. Uh, so we have a, another question from Stacy, uh, which is, you've spoken a lot about communication in the leadership. In terms of the Global Health Security Index, are you proposing that this index be updated according to changes in leadership? Not according to changes in leadership, but actually that leadership should be included and elements of leadership. Like, what does it take to lead in a pandemic? And, you know, we have plenty of case examples, right, from very good leadership of Jacinda Ardern to very bad leadership of Donald Trump. And so I think our very good leadership of Governor Charlie Baker to very bad leadership of Ron DeSantis De Sanctus in Florida. So I think if we, we shouldn't have those elements without these more political elements about leadership, good communication, belief in science, belief that everyone matters, right? There are things that, that can be gleaned that could be a whole thesis for somebody about what is leadership in a pandemic look like and how would we incorporate that into the sense of uh, a sort of pandemic preparedness and pandemic response. There is also a question from Caroline. What advice would you give regarding the creation of sustainable healthcare systems in developing countries as opposed to simply throwing resources at people? Since trust is such a huge part of it, how do you formulate that relationship as an outsider? Yeah. Um, I don't really think a lot of money is being thrown. So in that case, I probably wouldn't agree. You know, the money is just far too scarce for what we need. You know, watching throughout my career, people die of a broken leg because there's no money for anesthesia or a surgeon. Like I, I just, I throw more money. I'd be happy with that. Um, it's how the money's used. I'm very fortunate at Partners in Health that I'm never fully an outsider because our team, we have 18,000 people that work at Partners in Health and only about 100 are American. So throughout the world, they are Haitians working in Haiti, Rwandans working in Rwanda, et cetera. And so I'm not making sort of decisions for black and brown people, right? my colleagues are working together with community members to make decisions and priorities. And they are often from these communities. Um, they're always from the countries. They're often even from the local communities. So I think we've created a system by which we're in really um, giving resources, monetary resources, the right educational tools, for local people to be strategizing on the solution. So I feel that I'm there as a, as a support, but I'm not there as a decision maker per se. I've never actually, in my 21 years at PIH, I've never controlled a budget. Um, I'm just, you know, help think through strategy, but it's driven by our local national staff. So. I'm very fortunate in that way. And so I would say to any of you that are interested in this field, make allies with local people. You know, we have to get out of the colonial mindset. I think decolonization, which is now being talked about a lot, and I'm super happy about that, but it does mean putting power, and the word empowerment is so overused, but putting power in the hands of people of color to make appropriate decisions, right? And not judging what those decisions might be uh, because they may be different. And that's why I point out food security in Massachusetts as a ranking problem. I mean, I would not think that. Look at where I'm sitting. Obviously food security is not an issue for me. So if we had just said, no, 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 that's not the problem. No, you've got to listen to affected people. And um, so make common cause with uh, the people you're working with and try to enable them. I mean, your position of power coming from Princeton, you know, perhaps coming from the United States, if you do, is getting resources to the people who are closest to the suffering. Um, and that's, that to me is the way out. That's the way out. We have a Kathy, oh, sorry, go, go ahead, ahead Heidi. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Kathy who asks, 
how well are people recovering from COVID? Are we seeing secondary issues that come from it that will linger and cause issues for people mentally and socially, similar to some of the issues that happened with Ebola? I, I'm sure there will be. I haven't studied that as much yet, um, but I'm sure there will. And we, you know, we, we have plenty of reports. So it's not my area of expertise, but it does look like there will be long-term sequela. Andrew asks, if you can please speak more about implementing accountability. It seems that it's partly dependent on leaders who actually take it upon themselves, but there is no forcing someone to do something. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think this is where democracy is very important. Um, you know, where voting is very important because, you know, in countries where democracy works, not sure I believe our democracy works anymore, but in countries where democracy works, people should be voted out if they don't respond in a way that supports people. And, you know, interestingly, you know, in some of the places I work, that level of accountability may even be at a very local level. It might be a mayor, right? It might be, um, and, and interesting, I'll go back to Newark for a second, Mayor Ross Baraka, who is from Newark, he's African-American, and he starts every discussion by saying, you know, we have, we, right? We have to do this because I love you guys, right? There is this level of accountability that he has for the people of Newark and we'll break it down for people that, you know, we're going to have to have stricter quarantine because we've had more oppression, because we have more people living in the same spaces. So I think that there is still the democratic process in theory that will hopefully sort itself out along the lines of reason. I think the power of protest is still a very important way to hold people accountable. It did not work uh, with Breonna Taylor's killers, um, but I do think it has a suasive thing. So I think you have both the power of the ballot, you have power of popular protest, and you know there's always the softer things like writing your Congress people um, in the US around the world. I do think health is very political and people run on healthcare. Uh, so, you know, I think it would be difficult for many countries, France, for example, to defund their health service. I think people would revolt. So, so I, I think it's it really about how you engage along the lines of holding governments accountable. I think if you look at the, the movement that stopped the repeal of the Affordable Care Act, that was popular protest that stopped it. And really, at the end of the day, it was maybe three to 5,000 people who really changed that. And many of them were people living with disabilities. So, um, you know, these are examples of the fact that people can hold government or governments accountable as did the AIDS movement as well. And we have a question from Stacy who asks, related to the states versus federal rights, while the ideology of that is deeply rooted in slavery, on the other hand, don't you think this structure has helped some states to provide better responses against or in, despite the lack of action or the poor action from the current administration? I wouldn't, I would say despite, but that's really not acceptable. So for example, the state of Massachusetts uh, and Governor Baker, who's a Republican, right? He went out on a limb, gave a big contract to Partners in Health to help with contact tracing. He negotiated himself with Chinese companies to bring in PPE. Um, the government actually commandeered that PPE, the federal government. Uh, so I don't think the state's rights narrative helps anybody but the notion of white supremacy. It doesn't even really help white people, right? It just helps the, the, the practice of white supremacy. But can states succeed despite that? Sure, but I don't think it's so unnecessary. 
And it's an unnecessary barrier and hurdle that is resulting in untold suffering. So, uh, you know, I don't think there's anything positive that comes out of that. Okay, so. We have um, one more question actually. Oh, a um, couple more, sorry. So we have a question from Carolyn who says, uh, I would also love to hear your perspective on the denial that PIH faced from the scientific community Regarding your success in treating these diseases in developing countries, how do you overcome or work around all of the bureaucracy to affect widespread change? Yeah, that's a great question. It's, it's always a fun question to answer. Um, you know, this, the scientific community um, has definitely been, <laughs> been tough on us. Like even now with COVID, you can't do contact tracing. It's too late. It's this and that. I think because we really work hard to take our cues from the most affected people, and this is why our community engagement is so important, community members are part of our team. You know, 11,000 of our 17,000 partners in health staff are community health workers. <laughs> so when you're listening to the most affected, you just get a very different view. So, you know, so some, you know, famous scientists, you know, at Harvard might be saying, well, contact tracing is too late. But then I have a mom saying, you know, writing to me and saying, if it weren't for your team, we wouldn't have gotten formula for our baby. Right. So I don't actually care what they say. So I think to me, what allows us to combat sort of scientific nihilism, the idea that like this theory is more important than the actual work is just proximity to the suffering. So I would say for any of you who wanna do this work, um, I, I, I try, and that's why I drove down to Newark yesterday, I try to hold myself accountable to being on the front lines as much, as much as possible because it's easy to forget. It's easy to forget what it's like to not be able to feed your kid, you know? Um, so I think that's the main way we have combated that is to just keep ourselves honest with the front lines who we're serving. Um, yeah. We have another question in your work around the world. How have you faced the apparent or real politicization of health concerns? Apps, yeah, it ju just embrace it. All health is political. And if you don't understand that going in, you're just going to be so depressed. I mean, yeah. and I think like no one prepared me for that in medical school. And even in the school of public health, I was not prepared for the fact that treating TB is political. Like who would have thought that you're treating, you know, we almost got kicked out of Peru for treating drug resistant TB because the the TB program didn't even want to admit it was there because that would be an indictment of their ability to control TB and therefore the government's ability. And, you know, and so I, you know, when you see Trump with his charts and like saying, oh, we're doing so well and like, what is that about? I mean, so basically health is political. It's driven by political and social forces. The analysis and evaluation of governments along the lines of health is very political. So I think you just have to know it going in um, and just keep learning and keep listening. Um, and because nobody, I hope now we're teaching different things, but when I was in my training, it just never occurred to me that these things were as political as they are. We have a question from Jayoon, um, who says, thank you very much for coming today. On the global scale, would you share your thoughts on COVID in relation to other infectious diseases, especially TB, HIV, and malaria? TB kills more people than COVID every year, but it seems that the conversation has shifted to COVID. Yeah. Given limited resources in the world, how may we best allocate them so that we can continue progress and minimize the risk of losing decades of work in TB, HIV, and malaria? Yeah, thank you, Jayun. This is on my mind every day. I'm a member of the board of the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria. 
And so we're trying to figure out how to deal with this because COVID is a threat because of the rapidity of its uh, spread, but it has really had services for other much more significant diseases that kill more people grinding to a halt. So how to, and that's why somebody's first question about maintaining services being a factor of pandemic preparedness, right? Because if everything falls apart while you rush around to do COVID. So, you know, the global fund anyway is trying to put money into COVID related to the diseases. Uh, so for example, our organization partners in health, we're trying to work with the WHO to have rapid COVID tests approved and funded through the fund for TB patients. Because, you know, if you're diagnosing, you know, TB has a lot of overlap with the kind of symptoms you have with COVID. So people are scared to even do TB tests. So what we see is a very declining case notification of TB. So we are thinking about how to integrate these services, but it is a critical, critical question um, because we don't want to lose the gains we've made and we want to make more gains, whether it's on saving women's lives from dying in childbirth to, you know, diagnosing, treating uh, successfully TB. So uh, that's, that's a hot topic right now. Maddie asks two questions. Um, considering how COVID-19 has impacted other global health in initiatives in the global south and public health delivery systems, what actions and policies can be adopted to continue this critical global health campaigns, um, like vaccination campaigns, despite the enduring pandemic? This is the first one, if you want to address it first. Yeah, and there, and I'll read the second one too. Also, what limitations in public health infrastructure in the global south have been, eluc been elucidated by COVID-19 and what steps can be taken to remediate some of these gaps? So they're really related questions. Um, I think what we need to do to continue services, whether to Jayun's uh, excellent question or yours, Maddie, is we need sufficient staff right, so that you can have dedicated staff to support COVID screening, um, even COVID isolation units, right? We need the, the right PPE and supply chain for that. Um, because everyone, what we're doing in the US and what's been mostly successful, though we're having an outbreak right now in the hospital that I'm on staff at the Brigham, um, is, is to, to have a heightened awareness and to be able to screen everybody with COVID. So we need to have more money in labs, in supply chain, and in human resources so that we can keep routine services going. Because you can't ask the, the workers to just do a vaccination campaign if they're not going to be protected. And so we have to have systems that will protect the workforce. And so it's not only having the workforce, but protecting them. And I think what this has elucidated for us is the weakness in these systems. So the weakness in supply chain, right? The weakness in having oxygen, right? In the countries that I work in, there are no oxygen generator plants, right? Um, and so how can you deal with COVID without oxygen, right? But you should never have been dealing without oxygen because pneumonia is a major killer. So I think really doing a better job of taking those, taking the disease burden as it is today. I mean, to me, pandemic preparedness is this, right? The disease burden as it is today and designing and funding a system to deal with that. If you did that, you'd be way ready for pandemics. But instead, we're kind of like doing little vertical programs and like just getting by. And so the pandemics then expose these weaknesses in supply chain, et cetera. And so I think we've got to put money in that's quote unquote related to COVID, but that money needs to be then sustained internationally and related to the long-term buildup of systems that work. Yes, I'm thinking also about um, other related um, 
lacks of technology and maybe you know structural pro problems that are being exposed now right like such as access to internet there are so many people around the world students that have no access to, mm -hmm. to schools right at this time and that um will not have um i'm thinking of brazil where i come from that mm -hmm. people have been trying to go back to school but it seems impossible still yeah. at this time and um you know all the public of course education um you know most of the people there will not have access to or proper access to the internet um so yes thinking about technology in this sense as well okay so Thank you so very much. Well, thank you all. Your... Sorry to have to delay this several months, but it was great to talk to all of you. We're all sorry for that. And we thank you very much for being so, um, you know, ready <laughs> to come back when, <laughs> when we invited you again. Thank okay. you very much. I'm, I'm sorry we cannot do the, the clapping, you know, with everyone okay. that is participating. <laughs> Just do snaps. <laughs> yes. Thank and you, you're yourself. getting thank yous in the chat. Thank you very, very much. Bye. This was great. Okay, bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. I think we just leave, right? Yes, I think we're all good. Okay, thank you. Thanks, everyone. Yep, thanks. Can we